This sermon is titled End Times Bible Prophecy Antichrist False Prophet Mark of the Beast Part 2 Be enriched as you listen All right morning once again Thank you for being with us today and uh, we are doing a series on the end times and Bible prophecy and I just want to warn you that today the message will be a little intense uh, so you know, do what you can to take it in. And also a little disclaimer, you know, sometimes people visit us and uh, we're in the middle of a series like this. They come, you know, for three Sundays and they say like, man, this pastor, he only talks about end times. <laughs> you know, no, you just happen to be in the middle of a series and three Sundays, you know, three or four Sundays, we, you know, we, have been, we talk about end times. Um, so please don't judge a pastor by a sermon. <laughs> I want to remind you that there are 20 years worth of sermons on our church website. Uh, please don't judge a church by one or two services you attend. You know? uh, there's a lifetime of uh, ministry behind all this. So on our church website, we've got all the sermons there and you can evaluate us based on that. Okay. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about the Antichrist, Paul's prophet and Mark of the Beast. That's our focus, and our intent is not to magnify the Antichrist, make him look good, or the false prophet, any of that. You know, uh, we're going to look at this because it's in the Bible. We need to understand it, but the two things I really want us to, uh, I want to really bring out or highlight. One is the, um, the amazing uh, truth, uh, or the amazing uh, fact of Bible prophecy, things that were spoken hundreds of years, some thousands of years ahead of time. You know, and when we look at it, we will just be amazed that, that God could do this. He could speak to His people, reveal things well in advance. So Bible prophecy is so amazing that when we look at it. And the second thing I really want us to rec recognize is that the time in which we live, Really, the things that were spoken of thousands of years ago can actually be fulfilled in our day and time. Perhaps 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, these things could not be fulfilled. But we are actually living in a day and time when the things that were spoken then, written in the scriptures, can be fulfilled in our day and time. That's the time in which we are. So if we can get these two things out of all that we talk about, the Antichrist, false prophet, and image, mark of the beast, I think that's what we want to focus on. So, when will the Antichrist... We're going to answer a few questions as we go along. When will the Antichrist be revealed? And I want us to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Again, I want to remind you, the sermon notes are all up, are on, already on the website, which has a lot more details. I will be going through these things very quickly, so in case you fall asleep, lose some thoughts, <laughs> hey, it's all in the notes, right? Plus, you can also listen to the recording uh, later on. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 through 8, Paul writes here, Now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed, that the Antichrist may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So what is restraining must be taken out of the way, and then the Antichrist, the lawless one, will be revealed. So the big question is, what is Paul referring to when he says, he who now restrains must be taken out of the way? And uh, I, what I want us to, what I want to put forward to us today is that he who now restrains is the church, the body of Christ, or Christ through his body, the church being taken out of the way, not the person of the Holy Spirit. Many times people say, no, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. But actually, when you read the book of Revelation, and through the seven years of tribulation, the Holy Spirit is still at work on the earth. Uh, we can look at many examples of it. There are 144,000 Jews who are sealed by God, and sealed in the New Testament refers to the presence of the Holy Spirit. There are people who will be saved during the tribulation and you cannot be saved apart from the Holy Spirit because you are born again by the Spirit. There will be people who will be testifying. Uh, there, there are two witnesses who will be ministering, uh, doing signs, wonders and miracles in the name of the Lord. And that's all by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, Zechariah 12, 10, God says, I will pour out the spirit of grace and supplication on the house of Israel. So there he clearly states he's going to be pouring out the Holy Spirit in those days on the house of Israel. So there are many references that, that clearly teach us the Holy Spirit will be continuing his work on the earth even during the seven years of tribulation. So our only option is Christ through his church. The body of Christ is taken out of the way and then the lawless one is revealed. You all with me so far? Yeah. So the rapture takes place and then the seven years of tribulation begins. So the rapture of the church takes place first, then the seven years of tribulation begin. Another way to look at it is this. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, you see the verse coming up on the screen. Um, God tells, you know, John, come up here. And John is caught up into heaven. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm going to show you things that are yet to come. So everything from Revelation 4 1 is out in the future. And Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is a scene of the raptured church in heaven with the elders being given their positions around the throne of God and the saints gathered all around the throne of God worshiping God. That's out in the future right after the rapture of the church. End of chapter 5, Jesus comes forward and he opens, he, he's the only one qualified to open the scroll. That means he's the only one qualified to set these prophecies that have been written into motion. End of chapter 5. And the first thing that happens, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. You see that the rider comes, when the first seal is open, a rider comes riding on a white horse. That is the Antichrist. Because the real Christ comes in Revelation 19. He comes riding on a white horse, but that's the real Christ. Revelation 6, 1 and 2, first seal, the Antichrist comes on the sea. You're with me? So he comes riding on a white horse as a man of peace. He has a bow. He's got military strength. Uh, he has a crown. He has dominion and influence. And he goes about conquering, uh, con to conquer and conquer. He's extending his influence. So the tribulation begins, Revelation 6, 1, the seven years of tribulation begin after the church is raptured, chapters 4 and 5, Revelation, and with the manifestation, the unveiling of this rider on the white horse, which is the Antichrist. So that's another way of looking at it. You all with me so far? You can always rewind the tape. Listen again. <laughs> so, so, who is this Antichrist? What will he do? Who is this false prophet? What will he do? We go to Revelation chapter 13. And uh, we take an in-depth look at Revelation 13. So we're going to read Revelation 13. We're going to read it verse by verse. And I'm going to make comments there. Now, Revelation 13, the Antichrist and the false prophet, um, actually happens in the middle of the tribulation. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 is the start of the seven years of tribulation. By the time we come to Revelation 13, we are in the middle of the seven years of tribulation. Right? So that's where Revelation 13 is. Let's read it, verse, verse 1 onwards. Now, I want to say this, that in order to understand, uh, especially end time prophecy, we need to really study the, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, 9, and 10, 11, 12. We need to study the book of Revelation, also study some things in between, what Jesus spoke about the end times, that, Matthew 24, uh, what Paul wrote about the end times, 2 Thessalonians 2. And we need to put all of these, thing, th these things together, and then it's like all these mysteries just become very clear. Now, we don't have time to do that. So, you have to trust me on what I say. So when we read Revelation 13, and we read all these strange symbols, and I tell you, this means that, I don't have time to tell you, okay, you know, turn over here, here. But I can tell you that the reason I'm saying something means this is because of what's stated in, for example, in Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Revelation 17. It's because it's stated in other places, you can interpret some of these symbols. Okay? But it's all there in Scripture, right? So let's begin Revelation 13, verse 1. John is seeing this vision. The Lord is revealing these things to him. He says, I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So you're like, man, what is this? You know, seven heads, ten horns, ten crowns, blasphemous name. It's coming out of the sea. We'll talk about the sea a little later. But the seven heads 
based on what we, we will be seeing in Daniel chapters 2, 7, and 8, and also in Revelation 17, verse 10, the seven heads are talking about seven world empires. Um, the leaders of the seven world empires. So the seven world empires are the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Medes and Persians, the, uh, the Greek, then the Roman, and the seventh one is a mix of iron and clay. It's a mix of what belonged to the former Roman Empire with the rest of the peoples of the earth. That's the seventh one. That's the time in which we are living. Okay? So seven heads, seven kings. So the beast is coming, and he's, he has, he's coming out of this region that, 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 where all this, these things were happening. We will see as we go into Daniel 2, 7 and 8, it will make more sense. He's coming out of this, and he has ten horns. Ten horns represent ten leaders. And when you look at Daniel, and also in other places in Revelation, Revelation 17, these ten horns are ten leaders from the region that belonged to the former Roman Empire. And there are ten leaders, these ten horns undergird the Antichrist. So he comes out. He, he has their support, ten leaders of countries that belonged to the former Roman Empire. So seven heads. They have crowns, which means crowns representing their dominion influence. Uh, ten horns and, ten, and their crowns uh, representing uh, their uh, influence. Verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Again, you have to trust me on this, and we will see this in Daniel chapter uh, 7 and 8. The leopard represents the Greek empire. The bear represents the Medo-Persian empire. And this is all stated in Daniel 8. I'm not making it up. Okay? And the lion represents the Babylonian empire. Uh, we will see this in Daniel 2, 7, and 8, right? So this beast, this mantic, antichrist, is coming out with the traits of these empires. And so the, the Greek leopard, Medo-Persian, bear, and lion, Babylonian. You with me? These all empires, I'm not making, they all, they all existed. Where is he getting all this? It's, it's there in the Bible. I'm not making it up. It's in history, right? And so this, this beast is coming out with, he's part of this whole empires that have happened. And what is interesting is if you overlap and say, okay, if I want to zero in, what would these countries be that present day countries that exist in an overlapping region of these three empires, you can kind of come up with some You'll identify some of these countries, um, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestinian territories, Jordan, Egypt, Kuwait. These, are, these countries lie in the overlap of these three world empires, these three empires. Right? I'm not saying he, he comes only from here. Daniel gives us more information. But this is what is the description based on Revelation 13 to leopard, bear, lion, all part of this Antichrist. So he's probably going to come from one of these Nations. There's a wider region that Daniel has pointed to. Verse 3. Please don't get lost in one of those empires. We are here. Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. Oh, sorry, I just need to back up there in verse 2. And the dragon gave him his power. So this beast, this antichrist, receives his power from the dragon. The dragon represents the devil, Satan. Revelation 12, 9 and 10. The dragon is Satan. Satan is empowering him. That's why he's the antichrist. He is Satan working through a human person. Satan empowers this man. And he gets his authority, his influence empowered by the devil. Now verse 3. And, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So this man, in the middle of this seven years of tribulation, remember, at the beginning of the tribulation, he comes as a man riding on a white horse. He comes as a man of peace. He establishes a covenant of peace. And so he's recognized as a very influential leader. 
in the middle of the seven years of tribulation, suddenly his whole uh, way of working and speech changes. And there is an assassination attempt on his life. Verse 3. He is attempt to kill, but he survives that. And what happens? The whole world marvels at this man. They begin to follow him. Verse 4. So they worship the dragon. So in being taken up by this beast, they're actually worshiping Satan. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like this beast? Who's able to make war with him? Verse 5, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. It's the second half of the seven years of tribulation. You all with me? So he is speaking blasphemous things. These are things that Daniel wrote about. That this is what this, you know, this man of sin will do. He'll speak blasphemies against God. God, he will desecrate the temple of God. All this happens in the middle of that three and a half years. He begins to do these things. He's going to be allowed to do this for 42 months, three and a half years. Verse 6, then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, that's the temple. He desecrated and those who dwell in heaven. Verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So he's making war with the saints. The saints represent both the Jewish people and those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is clear for us in Revelation chapter 12, the preceding chapter, where it's clearly stated he's, he's going after Israel. Uh, there in Revelation 12, Israel is represented by uh, the the woman who gave birth to the man child, that's Jesus. So this, this, this Antichrist is going after Israel and those who have the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 12 states that. So saints here refers to both the Jewish people and those who are believers in Jesus Christ. And his influence extends globally over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him. They're coming under his influence they're beginning to admire him. They're beginning to just worship him. Whose names have not written in the book of life of, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has a year to hear, let him hear. Are there any listening here this morning? Say amen. All right. Verse 10. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. So what God is saying is, you know, during this tribulation, it's going to be difficult to be a believer in Jesus. And this is the only thing that's going to give you faith and endurance. That you have the assurance that those who lead into captivity, they themselves will one day be taken captive by the Lord. Those who kill by the sword, they themselves will face the sword of the Lord one day. So that gives you that faith, that endurance to go through this. You with me? So that's what that verse is saying. Um, but don't worry, you won't be there. Verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So verse 11, John is saying another beast, the second beast. The second beast is the false prophet. Again, you, you'll find references to this in, in, the, in the chapters that come up. And even in Revelation 19, he's called the false prophet. He comes like a lamb. Again, the true lamb of God is Jesus. This beast... Is a person who imitates the lamb. He comes like a lamb. And he speaks like a dragon. He's very deceitful, very cunning, very deceiving in his speech. And he is, he's working along with the Antichrist. So the Antichrist and the false prophet, these are men, people. And they are beginning to do their work in the second half of the tribulation. Now... Notice, and now I'll make a comment there. Gen um, Revelation 13, 1, he the Antichrist, the first beast comes out of the sea. Revelation 13, 11, the second beast comes out of the land. What's the difference? Actually, they're used in a synonymous manner. If you look at Daniel chapter 7 and also Revelation 17, sea is in, in prophetic language represents peoples, nations, tongues, and tribes, peoples. The land talks about what is of the earth as opposed to what is divine from above. So, and it's actually used interchangeably if you, in, in Daniel 7. So don't get too hung up on sea and land. Just, it just means that the Antichrist and false prophet are going to have influence over people. And they are not from God. They are from 
they are, they are again opposite of what is divine. Verse 12, and he exercises this, this second beast, the false prophet. He exercises all the authority of the first beast. That means the Antichrist is empowering him. He causes the earth and all those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So his main agenda is, I want to get people to worship the Antichrist. Verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So it's, you know, getting people, uh, deceiving them in order to make them worship an image of the beast. Verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. And the image of, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this false prophet is, is promoting a religion, a religious system. And that is to worship the Antichrist. He's now introduced an image of the beast and says, you worship this. And he's given lifelike characteristics to this image. It can speak and it can even kill people who refuse to worship it. Now, two things we're already saying. The Antichrist and the false prophet have global influence. There is global leadership influence. People around the world. And the Bible says even the kings of the world submit to their leadership. They come under their influence. Second, we are seeing a global religious system being introduced. People are made to worship the image of the beast. And we'll talk a little bit later on how these things can happen. The next thing we are going to see is a global financial system. Look at this. Verses 16 through 18. He, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, so that no one may buy or sell, that is, you can't transact, except one who has a mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate, do a little mathematics, calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, so the beast is a man, it's the number of a man, his number is 666. So what is this? So now you're having a financial system. You can't buy or sell until you receive a mark, either on your right hand or on your forehead. And the mark is either you have to have the name or the number or the mark of the beast. You've got to have this ID that's given by the beast. And how can you recognize it? It's the number of a name. Now, in Greek, the Greek alphabets correspond, every Greek alphabet corresponds to a number. So this man, the Antichrist, if you calculate the number of his name, that means you add it up, it'll work out to be six, six, six. That's what it means. Nothing complicated. But don't go around asking people, what's your name? No, name. <laughs> Let me calculate. <laughs> <laughs> no, relax. You won't be around. Right? The church is already raptured. So you don't know the name of the Antichrist. But God's put it in there for the people who will be on the earth at that time. So nobody can say, I didn't know he was the Antichrist. I've given you the clue. His name, you calculate the number of his name, and it will be 666. Refuse to take his mark. Don't do it. Right? But you're seeing here an introduction of a global financial system. Now we're going to come back and talk about these three things. This global leadership influence, a global religious system, and a global financial system. And what is going to happen to these things uh, as given in the Bible. But now, we want to answer another question. Where does the Antichrist come from? We've already had a little clue given in Revelation 13.2 about the leopard the bear, and the lion. But we go now to the book of Daniel to begin to understand what is this leopard, lion, and bear, and what do they mean? The book of Daniel is an amazing book to study. Now, there are two books in the Bible that most people avoid. It's the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. But these are amazing books. When you read them and understand, so, wow, all these things have been revealed ahead of time. 
Now, Daniel was a prophet. He lived for about 90 years, approximately, maybe a little longer. So he lived from 620 BC to about 530 BC. Now, when you look at BC, you have to go in reverse. Okay? So the the born is a higher number, the die, the lower number. You so like, well, how come that happened? <laughs> For me, it's the other way. Because you're living the other side of the new numbering system. Right? So he was born 620. He died around 530. These are approximate days. So he lived, prophet, was about yeah, 90 years of age. Now, the book of Daniel is an interesting book because, you know, when you read the book of Daniel, you think like, wow, he went to sleep, he woke up, he had a vision. It didn't happen like that. Daniel chapter 2 took place around 603 BC when Daniel was about maybe 17 or 18 years of age. He was a young Jewish boy in the Bab- courts of, the, of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. And Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He woke up, he said, I forgot my dream. Your wise men, come here. Tell me my dream and tell me the meaning of it. And Daniel was there. One of them, he was about 17 or 18 years of age. And he went and prayed, and God revealed the dream to him. And so he, he gives Nebuchadnezzar the dream and the meaning of it. But in Daniel chapter 2, something amazing happens. Daniel says, you know, king, you saw an image. The head was of gold. The chest was of silver. The waist was of brass. The legs were of iron. The feet were iron mixed with clay, and they were the ten toes. And in the days of that kingdom, when the iron mixed with clay, with ten toes, in the days of that kingdom, there was a big rock that came. It was not hewn with men's hands, but it was a rock that came out of heaven. And it crushed this whole image, and the rock became a huge mountain. What's the meaning? He says, hello king, you are the head of gold. You are that head of gold. You represent the Babylonian kingdom, represented by Nebuchadnezzar at that time. Thank you for putting up that image. You are that head of gold. After you will come another kingdom. So in Daniel chapter 2, he only identifies the head. That's the Babylonian empire. But he doesn't identify the others. But he tells the king, after you will come another empire. That's referring to the Medes and the Persians. And then after them will come another empire. Referring to the Greek. And after you will come another empire that's even more powerful than any of the other empires. Their legs of iron. But then what will happen is, that's the Roman Empire. Right? And I'll tell you how we know which all of these are. The Roman Empire. But after that what will happen? It will become iron mixed with clay. So if you look at the region of the world today, which was once part of the Roman Empire, what do we have? We have the original, the people who were belonged from, who were part of that Roman Empire, all those countries, but they're all mixed with the peoples of the earth. You all understand? Yes or no? Hello? Do, has anyone been, know about Europe? Yeah, so that's a major part of what was part of the Roman Empire. What will happen there? They were, they're not the original people, but most of them, it's like the rest of the seed of men are there. That's what Daniel said. That's the feet of iron mixed with clay. And then, the ten toes. The ten toes, later on you see, represents ten horns, which we read in Revelation 13, 1, are ten leaders. And in the days of that kingdom, That kingdom, the iron mixed with clay, there's going to come. Not a meteor, but it's the kingdom of God coming in. And God will set up his kingdom here on the earth. And you and I are living in that time of the iron mixed with clay. We are there. All the other empires already happened. Sorry, too late now. We are there with the iron mixed with clay. And the ten toes. Look out for them. So that was Daniel chapter 2. Now, 50 years later, in 553 BC, Daniel received his vision of Daniel chapter 7. 
So Daniel 2 was 603 B.C. Daniel 7 was 50 years later. Some people think, you know, like I said earlier, Daniel went to sleep, he woke up, he had a vision. No, 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 no. no. God was revealing time uh, over time. But think about this. When Daniel interpreted the, 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 the king's dream, he was speaking of empires yet to come. He had no idea. He was only there in the Babylonian empire with Nebuchadnezzar as king. But he was speaking ahead, talking about the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and then the time in which we would live and beyond. Speaking. Amazing. 50 years later, Daniel chapter 7, 553 BC. Daniel has a vision. And this time God is speaking through animal images. He sees different kinds of beasts. So, you know, so when you read Daniel 7, it's like, what is this, oh God? Why is this even in the Bible? All these strange beasts coming. But listen, they all correspond to each other. So when he saw the first beast that was like a lion, that corresponds to the head of gold, the Babylonian. That's why when we read Revelation 13, 2, I said, lion. Now, do you make the connection? It's there. In Daniel chapter 7, he's given then he saw an image like a bear. You read about the bear, Revelation 13 too? That's the Medes and the Persians. And then he saw the leopard coming in Daniel 7. You read about the leopard in Revelation 13 too. That represents the Greek. You all with me? You got lost somewhere. Like, you know, right? It's all there in the Bible. And then he saw a more powerful beast. More powerful than all the others. That's the Roman Empire. And, and then he saw ten horns coming out. Representing the ten toes. Right? So this is in Daniel chapter 7. I'm not reading those, those passages. But we're going to read a few verses there from Daniel 7. So let's go. I want, to, I want us to just read there from Daniel 7. So let's read this. Daniel 7, 17 and verses 23, 25. You all with me so far? Okay, this is what Daniel said. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall, break, which shall be different from all of the kingdoms. So this is the Roman Empire. It shall devour the whole earth. The Roman Empire was the largest empire that we've known. It will trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings. So what are those ten horns? You read in Revelation 13, 1. It comes with ten horns. What are the ten horns? There are ten kings who will arise from this kingdom. Ten kings means ten leaders. So we don't talk in terms of kings today. We're talking about leaders. Kings are a biblical language. Ten horns are ten kings which will arise from this kingdom. That is, they're part of this Roman Empire, but they're now in that feet part. And, shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and the times and half a time. One plus two plus half makes. Yeah, <laughs> One plus two plus half makes. Three and a half years. He's talking about the Antichrist. So what's he saying? You're going to have these ten horns come up from what was iron. So iron, the, the legs are, you know, iron mixed with clay. From that region, there are going to be 10 leaders coming up. And there's going to be another leader coming after them. He's going to overpower three. So he's going to really get, get three people under his grip. And this is the Antichrist. He's going to speak pompous things against the Most High. He's going to go after the saints. Exactly what we read in Revelation 13. You with me? See? It's all connected. He's going to do that. And he's going to be given this time He's going to begin three and a half years to do all this. Exactly what we read. Over in Revelation, it said 42 months. Here it's a time, times and half a time. 
Same translation. 42 months or three and a half years. So, Daniel has given us this information. Now, when you look at the, uh, the Roman Empire and modern Europe, so what he said is, from this region of iron mixed with clay, there was a Roman Empire, the feet of iron, but that became iron mixed with clay. From there will come these ten horns. So that's why the former Roman Empire is important for us. So we look at the map, we look at the region, you can see it, most of Europe, parts of Northern Africa, we come across into Turkey, and uh, some parts over into Western Asia. So he said, this will become iron mixed with clay. That's what we are seeing right now, loosely held nations. Especially when you look at the European Union, loosely held. Original people, but they have been mixed with clay, which is people from all other nations. Out of them will come 10 leaders. So we say, you know, uh, and now we of course know that, you know, we can identify there are about 45 countries that belong to this whole region. And who would be the 10 most influential? We can name some of those 10 countries. Uh, it's in the sermon notes, so you can go look it up. And, uh, right? So these are 10 most influential re- nations in this region. So you keep an eye on them. Because those leaders could be these 10 horns. And then there's going to arise another horn, another leader, coming from an obscure place, because in the chapter 8 he refers to him as a little horn, doesn't seem to have much influence, but he's going to get hold of three of them. And what we see in Revelation 17 is that ten, these ten leaders will actually prop up this little horn. They'll bring him into a place of prominence. You all with me so far? But what is so amazing is in chapter 8. So remember, chapter 7 was 50 years after the first vision of chapter 2. Chapter 8 is two years later. Right? He has another vision. And in this vision, God is giving him some more details. Let's look at it. I want to read us, I want us to read uh, a little good, you know, significant portion of chapter 8. Please follow with me. Chapter 8, verse 5. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. That means this goat was moving full speed, not even touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. So this goat was moving towards the east. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong... The large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came. So the big horn was broken, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and towards the glorious land. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of of the host, verse 11, And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his of his sanctuary was cast down. So this little horn is the Antichrist. Because this little horn is doing exactly what we read in Revelation 13. Are you over with me? So this little horn, he is He's moving towards the south, towards the east, towards the glorious land. That's the land of Israel. He's exalting himself against the prince of the host, against the Lord Jesus himself. He's stopping those daily sacrifices, exactly what the Antichrist will do. And he's desecrating the place of a sanctuary. So that's a little on. That's the Antichrist. Where will he come from? He said there's a goat, a long horn. And I've skipped some of the verses, but this goat is moving east. Very powerfully, very fast. But suddenly that long horn is broken. That big horn is broken. And four other notable ones come. And from one of them, the little horn comes. What does all this horn mean? Let's read on. Verse 19. Now, Angel Gabriel is explaining. And he said, look. I'm making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. The ram which you saw having two horns, these are what? The kings of Media and 
So he's told him, this was 553 BC. So that's the kingdom of Medes and Persia. He's given him the clue. So that was the ram. And what was the goat? Verse 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Daniel never saw the kingdom of Greece. This was 553 BC. The kingdom of Greece was 332 BC. Almost 200 years away or 150 years away. He never saw it. But the information is given to him. And then what else he said? The large horn that is between his eyes, who is that? It's first, that's Alexander the Great. The large horn. What will happen? Verse 22. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. So this horn will be broken, destroyed. And there will be four kingdoms that come out of that. But they won't have the same power and influence as Alexander the Great, as the first horn. And the latter time of their kingdom, that means later on, much later on, when the transgressors have reached fullness, so time is passing. These four kings have existed, but time is passing. And then what will happen? A king shall arise. That is the little horn, having fierce features. Who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. That is, he's empowered by the dragon. He shall destroy fearfully. He shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people, the people of Israel. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. That's against the Lord Jesus. But he shall be broken without human means. That means he's going to be destroyed by the Lord himself. Are you with me? Now, think about what actually happened. See, this is 553 BC. The Greek empire, Alexander the Great, became king at about 332 BC. He, and you can see the, he, when he became king, he was about 20 years of age. And in 10 years, in 10 years, he extended the kingdom right all the way from Greece. And he actually moved eastward. And I didn't read those verses. It's all in chapter 8. That this male goat will move east. He moved east exactly like Daniel wrote, prophesied. And he extended the kingdom all the way to northern part of India. Some of you, some of us who studied, were paying attention in history class. <laughs> he came all the way. But. At the age of 32, 10 years, he died. That's that long horn, that notable, that big horn that just... And then what happened? After him, four of his generals divided up his kingdom. And you can see the four parts of his kingdom. Exactly as Daniel prophesied. It's in our history books. But Daniel wrote history in advance. Before it happened. Four generals. And we, you know, you can, uh, we have all the names of these kingdoms. I don't want to, I can't even pronounce it. So <laughs> I'm not going to try. So we have the names of these four generals and their kingdoms. And of course, they were all fighting. And so the kingdoms expanded, you know, became bigger and shorter and all that. But the point is, Daniel wrote about this in Daniel chapter 8, hundreds of years before it actually happened. And in history, it unfolded. Now, why is this of interest to us? Because he said, so these four kingdoms will be there. Time will pass. And out of one of them will come the little horn, the Antichrist. So now we say, oh, out of one of these areas, countries that lie in these regions, the Antichrist will come. Are you understand? So he actually said, He's going to come from one of these. He's a little horn, meaning he's not, going to, he's not as powerful as these ten horns from the former Roman Empire. But he's coming from one of these four kingdoms uh, that were taken over by the four generals. The little horn will come. But he's going to have influence on three of these leaders that belong to the ten 
He will take over them. He will influence them. And they, the ten, will then prop them up. That's how he's going to come into power. So, you know, you can do a little study and identify, you know, let's put all the king, countries that possibly fit into this. There are about 34 countries or things that you can list out. And then you can try to narrow in on, you know, which are the most probable countries that we got to look at, like, you know, Egypt and Syria and Turkey, Iran, Kuwait, Greece, and there are other countries. And so, okay, let's look at them because they all fall in this region. Now, it's not like I want to go and shake hands with the Antichrist. That's not my interest. But like, hey, it's in the Bible. So let me look at those countries with interest and see how all this is playing out. Are you with me? So you read your Bible and also listen to the news. So I'm saying, I only read the Bible. But sometimes to understand the Bible, you need to listen to the news. Some of you can say amen. <laughs> right? So it's not like I don't listen. You have to listen because then it helps you understand the Bible. What's happening? Because all the, it's all written there and you're looking. Who are these potentially these ten horns that could come up from the former Roman Empire? Who could be, which is that country from which this little horn could arise that belonged to one of these regions, the four regions that, uh, that, that came out uh, from the Greek empire. And so you pay attention to it. So let's quickly, you know, I'll try to wrap things up now. Who is a false prophet? We saw that um, this false prophet is a religious leader because he's going to do signs and wonders and he speaks like a dragon. His main thing is to deceive people and to get people to worship the beast, the Antichrist. Get them to submit and worship the Antichrist. So he's another man. Uh, we don't have details on where he emerges from, but he's going to work alongside the Antichrist, a religious leader having great influence. And uh, when we say, okay, you know, what will the Antichrist and the false prophet do? We can summarize their main work in three things. There's, they're going to have global leadership influence. They're going to be, you know, the world, leaders around the world are going to be taken up by these two people. They're going to have, they're going to bring in a global religious system, which is to worship the image of the beast. And they're going to bring in a global financial system, which is to use an identification that, has, that is put forward by the Antichrist to transact. I mean, you think a little bit more about these, these things. All of these things can happen in our day and time. Remember, they're going to do this in three and a half years. Introduce, they're going to have global influence. They're going to introduce a global religious system. And they're going to introduce a global financial system. Within three and a half years. Now, this would not be possible 20 years ago. But you and I are living in a day and a time when this can happen. For example, last week, I think, or somewhere over the last two weeks, I think last week, X, formerly known as Twitter, was banned in Israel. As soon as they were banned, a company called, I think, Blue Sky, within three days, three million subscribers. Three million. Happened in a couple of days. That means, what's it telling us? You and I are living in a time when it's not going to take centuries or years or even months to get an idea out. It can happen in days. Literally, in days. So in order to have global influence, you know, in times past, it took years and years. You have to establish yourself. Today, it happens in days. In order to spread a philosophy, an idea, a tool doesn't require years, days. You know, chat GPT in November 2022. Overnight, everybody's like, where do you, where do you find? I got it on chat. <laughs> Hey, did you go through some special training? No, no, no. We all figured, figured this out. So today we are living in a time when influence, promoting an idea, promoting a system happens in days. 
I think we're all of us are using some form of digital transaction. You know, phone, just pay, pay. So we're all connected. And now they're trying to extend it globally so you can use your Google Pay to pay in you know, other parts of the world and so on. All that will happen. But our financial system, you can be here and transact anywhere in the world. 20 years ago, we were not, we were not doing this. Are you understanding? That means we are actually living in a time when Revelation 13 can actually be fulfilled. All the things written there, our time, it can happen. 20 years ago, we never thought, how could, you know, within three and a half years you set up a religious system? How in three and a half years you can get a financial system, system globally? Hey, today, it takes days. Everybody will subscribe. You got it in place. That's all. And this is the time in which we're living. Now, it doesn't stop there. I want to just highlight something else before we close. Worship team, please come. The Bible also talks about two witnesses. In Revelation 11. So starting in the middle of the seven years of tribulation till the end. There will be two witnesses that God puts on the earth. We know one is Elijah, because Malachi prophesied, Malachi 4, 4 and 5. He said, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. I'll send it, so Elijah will come back. There'll be another prophet. So don't ask me, is he going to have long beard? What, or is he going to wear t-shirt and jeans? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But Elijah will come. And second, there'll be another prophet. We don't know, probably Enoch, because he didn't die. So there'll be these two prophets ministering, doing signs and wonders and warning people, preaching the gospel. All that will be happening. But Revelation 11 says that towards the end of the three and a half years, the Antichrist will kill the two of them. And their bodies will lie. You can see this chapter, scripture there in Revelation 11, 7 through 11. Their bodies will lie on the streets of Jerusalem. And it says there, verse 9, it says that people of the nations will see their bodies lie. 20 years ago, that was not possible. But today, on your phone, you can see in real time what is happening in any other part of the world. And what did John say? Verse 9. People from all nations, they will see the bodies lying in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. We are in a time when this verse can actually be fulfilled. Twenty years ago, you had to wait for the newspaper or watch for the, you know, Doordarshan or something. Something like that. Today, in real time, you can see. And John continued, verse 10 and 11. He said, at the end of the three and a half days, this body, God will resurrect them and people will see them. All over the world, they see them taken up. Again, it can only be fulfilled in our day and time. Amen? So, these prophecies were written 2,000 years ago. How could John write two dead bodies in the street of Jerusalem and everyone else seeing it? How could he write something like that? John, if you're just outside Jerusalem, you can't see. You're saying people from all over the world will see their bodies in Jerusalem. Yeah, because God showed it to him. From the nations, they are seeing this happen. And we are in a time when that will be fulfilled. Now, Revelations chapter 17 and 18 tell us this. That while all this is happening, this religious system and financial system will crash. Revelation 17, as it, it tells us, it talks about this religious system as a mystery Babylon. That has been supported by these ten leaders, by the beast, the Antichrist. But then suddenly, verse 14 says that, Revelation 17, 14 says that these ten leaders, they turn against this mystery Babylon, this religious system. They turn against it, against a false prophet. And it says God puts it into their minds to do this. 
Suddenly they reject this. Hey, we don't want this. Comes crashing down. Revelation 18 talks about this global financial system. It says, the merchants of the world, they've all invested into this. And in one hour, they see their wealth disappear. All over the world. That can only happen in our day and time. 20 years ago, all our money was kind of secure. You put it in, you know, some bank here. It was all secure. Or you make an investment. It was somewhat, you know, I... Uh, insured or insulated from what happens in other markets. But today, global markets are so connected. Somebody sneezes there, something falls here. I mean, it's literally like that. The financial markets are so connected. So Revelation 18, it says, in one hour, Twice it says, one hour, all the wealth goes up like a smoke. This financial system collapses. And it can only happen now, the time in which we live. And Revelation 19 talks about Jesus coming on a white horse. And he deals with this antichrist and the false prophet. And he cast them into the lake of fire. Gets rid of them. Now, you know, some commentators will say, Oh, the Antichrist was Nero. Or he was, you know, Epiphanes IV, some Seleucid Empire king and all of that. But no, 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 cannot be read. Look at the whole story. Because the Antichrist must and only will be destroyed by the true Christ, Jesus Christ. And that has not happened. So we cannot ascribe anything that Daniel wrote or or Paul wrote or John gave in Revelation talking about the Antichrist to some historical figure. They come, they may come a little close or maybe it's your neighbor, I don't know, but but it cannot. You cannot ascribe it to anybody. That was a joke, right? Don't take me seriously. You cannot ascribe the Antichrist to some historical figure because it's very clear. He will only be destroyed by Jesus Christ. And Christ has not yet come. But when he comes, he's going to deal with the Antichrist. So you can't, you know, maybe there may have been historical figures who, you know, really troubled Israel and attacked Israel and did all kinds of mean things to the Jews. But there's one very big distinction and a couple of others as well, but one very big distinction It's that the Antichrist will be destroyed in Revelation 19 by the Lord himself. Which is still out in the future. So two things I want us to take away. The Bible that you have in your hand is an amazing book. It's an amazing book. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And if you read Daniel, and we've only looked at a few of his prophecies, some people reading Daniel say, this cannot have been prophesied. Somebody else must have written it. No, Daniel wrote it. Because the God of heaven was revealing things to him. That he could pinpoint and speak about Alexander the Great and what will happen to his empire and the empires that will come after. And what will happen? He could speak. And those legs of iron in Revelation 17, 10, it clearly specifies it's the Roman Empire. Because it says that's the empire that is or that was when John was writing. That's the Roman Empire. That's how we can say legs of iron talking about the Roman Empire. So it's amazing. The Bible you have is God's word. It's God speaking to you. Don't take it lightly. And second, like we mentioned last Sunday, We're living in a time when all that was spoken 2,000 and more years before cannot be fulfilled in our day and time. We are living in such a time as this. You and I must take our life seriously. God, why have you put me on the earth for a time like this? We are so close 
So close to the coming of the Lord. So close for all these things to be fulfilled. The church has just to be taken out of the way. And then Revelation 6, 1 and 2 kicks in. Seven years. We are so close. The stage has been set. Everything spoken of from Revelation 6 on can actually be fulfilled. Now, we are that close. And may each one of us find a sense of urgency. I'm not saying go out there and suddenly do random things. No, we have to be prayerful and seek the Lord and follow God's plan. But live with that sense of destinies. Live with that sense of purpose. God put me here for a time like this. Let's rise to our feet, please. May each one of us recognize his purpose. Recognize why he put you here. What does he want you to do? The same God who spoke to Daniel is still speaking. He hasn't gone quiet. He's still speaking. And he's ready to speak to you, speak to me. To reveal things to us. To say, look, this is what's coming up. Get ready. He's ready. But you and I must listen. Keep our ears open to the Lord. Keep our hearts open to the Lord. And say, God, what are those things you want me to do in the nations of the earth? And we are living in a time when God will accelerate His work. When God will put momentum into what needs to be done. There's an acceleration, a speeding up of things. Amos said, when God does this, when He rebuilds the tabernacle of David, He says, the sower will overtake the reaper. What does that mean? That means, Before they even finish reaping the harvest, the sower is coming and saying, hey, I'm ready to sow some more. But the the reaper is saying, hey, I haven't even finished reaping the harvest. It's, It's a picture of acceleration. It's a picture of momentum. The sower overtaking the reaper. And Amos prophesied, in the last days, God said, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David So that the children of Edom, talking about the Gentiles, they'll come seeking God. And it'll be such a seeking God that the sower will overtake the reaper. That means you you can't even get the harvest in. The next season's coming. It's going to be so, 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 so fast. And that's the time in which we are living. Amos chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. The time when the sower overtakes the reaper. A time when there will be so much of harvest and the work that's being done is so accelerating. God is doing a lot of things very quickly. And you and I are here. And so Father, we pray that you will put this momentum into each of our lives the sower overtaking the reaper. That kind of speed, that kind of acceleration, God. For too long, we've taken life easy. But God set things in motion in each of our lives. Set things into acceleration in each of our lives. Put momentum into each of our lives and what we are doing what we're called to do in fulfilling our assignments. We know the days will be dark. We know that in latter times there will be mockers and scoffers and deceivers. All kinds of things happening. But God, we want to shine bright. We want to walk true, walk faithful. 
and with speed, oh God, carry out the work you've called us to do. Carry out the work you've called each one of us to do. Father, we pray that in each of our lives we'll begin to see acceleration. We'll begin to see divine momentum, things picking up in what you've called us to do. That the things that are slowing us down, that seem to pull us, delay us, oh God, that those things will be taken out so we can move with speed to do the work you've called us to do. We can move quickly. And speak to each of us. Reveal your plans, reveal your purposes for each of us. Before we close, we always like to give an invitation to anyone who's never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. I know we were speaking about the end times and so on, but if you've been just, you know, just walked in, you came as a visitor, or, or if you've never made a decision in your life, in your heart to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want Jesus to be my Lord, my Savior. I want to give you an opportunity, an invitation to do that now, if you've never done this before. There's no compulsion. It should be done out of the willingness of your own heart. And if you feel that prompting inside you, I need to make a commitment to follow Jesus. The Bible tells us we need to believe in Him. We need to receive Him into our lives. 
And as many as received him, to them he gives the power to become the children of God. And if you've never done that, but you feel you want to do that this morning, I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And if you've never prayed this before, John, please join me and pray this prayer to receive Jesus Christ into your life. Let's pray. If you've never done this before, you feel prompted to do this, would you say this with me? Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Be my Lord and my Savior. And help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's anyone here, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. We want to celebrate with you because it's the best decision, the greatest decision you've made in your life. Heaven is rejoicing and we want to rejoice with you. So if you don't mind, could you please just wave your hand at me. Anyone here this morning, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. In this auditorium, just wave your hand at me, please. Anyone here? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? Anyone? Okay. I don't see any hand. But Oh, I see one hand there. God bless you. Just wave your hand. Wave your hand. Anyone here? Yeah. All right. Let's make sure we just want to give you a gift back there. That's free resources. And also, our ushers will give you a card where you can write your name and number and please hand it back to them. Anybody else? Don't move your side. Just wave your hand and we'll make sure we get this back to you. And take your name and number so we'll call you and let you know how to use the resources in the bag. All right. We're going to close. And... Um, uh, one of the things we will be doing is uh, setting up a Zoom call. It's call, you know, open question and answer. People may have questions on all these things we've been talking about. Uh, so we'll send the WhatsApp with the details so you can get on the call. Uh, it's like an open Q&A. You can ask our pastors, all of us, any questions on what we're doing, uh, this current series, uh, or anything else that you want to ask about Christian life, ministry, church, and so on. So we'll... We'll probably do that either this week or next week. We'll send the details. You're welcome. It'll be in the evening, so it should be convenient. But just to give, you, to give us opportunity to interact with questions and answers, and which you can't do on a Sunday morning, uh, you can get on the call and just ask. We'll probably do two calls before this series is over, so you'll have two opportunities to ask questions and you know, interact on that. Is that okay? Right, so we'll send you the details and just feel free. You know, asking questions is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, we just we'll do it on a Zoom call and we can discuss further. Thank you. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcw.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.